happy spooky month, Goth Gamer Nation. It's your boy. We back out here. Uh, good to talk about a game. This game's called Stygian Reign of the Old Ones is a turn-based Lovecraftian horror RPG developed and published by Turkish studio Cultic Games in 2019. In June of 2016, the studio launched a Kickstarter for Stygian, which seemed to be already well realized from the outset, and a release window was set for the following year. It was meant to weave several of H.P. Lovecraft's stories into a singular timeline and universe, wherein would be set a unique take on CRPGs like Planescape and the original Fallouts. So, two years after its estimated release date, word came down, Stygian was finished. It's been a long wait, the backers have been patient, and hopefully all the extra time in the oven will result in something really special and worth it. Oh, yeah, also, like, we, there's this little thing, it's, it's not it's not really important, you, you probably won't notice, but we cut like three-fourths of the proposed content out, pairing an expansive lore-rich 50-hour RPG down to a 15-hour experience that ends abruptly, but you can replay it a lot and there is also the vague promise that the story will continue in future installments. Not like this is a now an episodic adventure that we will build with a, a drip feed of DLC, but just like sequels, maybe, possibly. Anyway, the important part is, the game is out! Also the leather-bound game case, fully illustrated children's book with figurine set, handcrafted robes with logo brooch, shirts and posters, they're all right on schedule, baby. Sorry about the game, though. Stygian currently stands with mixed reviews on Steam. Though Though its ranking on Metacritic is more forgiving, but to be fair, not many noteworthy news outlets have covered it yet. I didn't mean to be like this bitchy up front because mixed is an appropriate reflection of my feelings. But you have to understand that like I just finished this a few hours before getting my thoughts down. So the things I found successful or enjoyable seem a little distant right now. But I assure you they're there. It's just it's just that conceptually Stygian Reign of the Old Ones is on paper a slam dunk for me. Like this is something I probably would have contributed to had I been aware of it. From the beginning it was obvious that this team had a wonderful idea, a unique art style, and clear understanding and appreciation of the source material. So it's because of this that any slight towards me and my expectations or gaming sensibilities is twice as hurtful. It's rolled a critical hit every time. You know, because RPGs and whatnot. Fuck you. I won't take up too much of your time in this section because it's been a while since I've had this many notes I wanted to hit, but mostly because I'm frightened that if I stall too long before talking about the game outright, you'll lose interest and click on whatever chill hop playlist or version of Plastic Love is waiting for you in the recommended videos. So here's uh, the here's the video. Thanks for sticking around, and uh, you know what? I just wanted to say that. It, usually I have a wiki, a wiki page or something to help me out with all the details. It's just this game is a little too new for that. So I'm just going to go off memory here. So uh, if you played this game, like I'm doing my best. <laughs> uh, I was in an emotional state while playing this game. Stygian is a really earnest attempt to draw from the entirety of H.P. Lovecraft's writing and distill it into the trappings of an RPG. And it's not really watered down. There are clear characters and settings and plot points referenced from The Color Out of Space, Call of Cthulhu, The Silver Key, The Dreams in the Witch House, and a, a dozen others. And all these bits and pieces are kind of crammed together in the fictional town of Arkham, which, following a mysterious and cataclysmic event, referred to as the Black Day, has been plucked from terra firma and dropped into a hostile, purgatory-like alien landscape. Our created character is one of the citizens of Arkham who have been trying to, and mostly failing, to adjust, understand, or come to terms with their bizarre and terrifying fate. Everyone is miserable, aimless, preferring to indulge in alcohol or drugs rather than burden their already fragile psyche trying to wrap their heads around the weird fiction nightmare their reality has become. A year prior, our character was visiting visited by a mysterious, faceless figure who instructs you to find him after the Black Day. We've been hiding out in the attic of a bar called the Old Eel, beginning to doubt the existence of what we now refer to as the Dismal Man, when finally he appears to us in a dream. This is meant to be the main story thread, to find the Dismal Man and unravel the meaning behind a cryptic poem he leaves with you. With your motivation being 
the feeling that there is some kind of hopeful significance to his interest in you, I'm guessing. What you'll actually be doing is very loosely associated with this overarching task. It's more like you complete quests and wander through a series of horrific circumstances, like some kind of Lovecraftian Forrest Gump, and every once in a while something will vaguely link back to the search for the Dismal Man, and prove his poem to be working as a self-fulfilling prophecy. As a fan of Lovecraft's writing, a lot of this was a pure delight to see integrated so well into a CRPG. The idea of consolidating this mythos into a universe to play in, like Middle Earth or the World of Darkness, is ambitious and exciting, and I was charmed by it. I mean, I know there's like Delta Green and the Call of Cthulhu tabletop, but that requires knowing more than one other person well enough to participate in a recreational activity, and uh, fuck that! In the wake of this disaster, two opportunistic factions have taken control of Arkham and its surrounding ruins. The first faction is the Mafia, led by a former hitman and current psychopath named Waxface, who, spoiler alert, uh, we we never see. He does not appear in the game. He's referred to a lot, but we never see him. They've taken over most of the buildings and businesses and brutalized the people of Arkham to the point where they are terrified to even mention them in the streets. The other group is an esoteric cult that seems to have originated from a secret society of intellectuals out of Miskatonic University. I get the impression that they had already been dabbling in the occult and had been familiar with events or possibilities like this before the Black Day. So when it actually happened, it reaffirmed their beliefs and emboldened them to religious zealotry, to the point where they are going around branding people and proving their devotion by carving symbols into their flesh, each one representing some part of their humanity they have transcended. Every time a new story element popped up or some deep cut reference would show up, I'd get excited not only because it's cool seeing this brought to life, but because it's being done with a respectable fanboy reverence. And on top of that, the language is a pretty accurate portrayal of Lovecraft's trademark cosmic horror writing style, though sometimes I think they go just a smidge overboard with it, and uh, like a lot of newer explorations of his material, they do make an attempt to add some gritty realism. Lovecraft's work was very tame when it came to profanity and even gore, but this interpretation of course revels in that quite a bit, which is not my favorite thing, it, it goes against what makes some of his writing effective to me, but I understand that's just what creators invariably want to add to these stories. They want to push it further, and I get that. Be careful not to pull too hard, you'll yank all the wires out. They even go as far as incorporating era-appropriate racism, which in itself is, is an interesting thing to remark on given that the foundation of a lot of Lovecraft's writing stems from xenophobia. It's kind of amusing to see that darkly satirized by creating this character whose mind has been broken and he sort of hopelessly locked himself into this offensive pantomime. In any case, I was really enjoying this story, and I think that kind of hit its apex somewhere around getting into the Arkham Theater, which involves disguising yourself as a cult member. We're trying to get into this theater because we're meant to witness a vision of sorts that is part of the cult's initiation. When you sit down in one of the theater seats, we are transported back in time to moments before the cataclysm. What follows is a fantastic and intensely abstract animated depiction of what happened on the Black Day. I was smiling a lot through all of this, and the thought in my head, I can still hear it clear as day, was, I like where this is going. It was the biggest slice of genuine plot that they had served up for a while, and it was a pretty good one. But it's directly after this moment that my cattiness from earlier was born. I like to think I can artfully express my opinion every now and then, but I don't think I can word it all that differently than everything after this moment. It ain't nearly as tight. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> skip to here if you don't want to have the ending spoiled, but I'll try to frame this in a way that you still get the gist of my reasoning after the jump. I'm just gonna go through the main beats and then we'll meet up with you right after, you know, this, you skip to this time. Didn't this used to be easier? Like when we had annotations, you could just click on that and we don't have that anymore, do we? I don't think we do. I'm not gonna look into it. So, I'm sorry. I, it's just that I, I can tell you the last thing that happens. I can't entirely say it was an ending. It's just the final scene in a sequence of scenes. So I guess if that meets the definition, you get out of the theater, and in my case, I was after the inventor who was trying to patent a rudimentary hazmat suit. I needed that suit because I'm trying to find a Latin translation of the Necronomicon. And since a pile of rubble blocks the entrance to the university, I'm gonna go to that dude's house that wrote it. I think 
that's what happened. Which is at the end of an area called the Blasted Street. This area, in all aspects of the game, is just the death rattle of my enjoyment. But this area, it lifted from the color out of space, is being hit by waves of this intense psychedelic light, and it's populated by mutated bodies that are fused together. So, we shoot and stab this, uh, incomprehensible, drive you insane just looking at it, alien miasma, until it explodes, and we get to this puzzle house, and nothing of real consequence happens for a while. And like, the loose threads of the plot started to drift away, and I found myself forgetting why I was there, and what exactly I was trying to accomplish. Maybe this was an intentional stab at a Ludo narrative, but I question that. The important bit is, we meet the cover of a Swans album, and talk to it, and make some kind of fucking blood pact with it, which leads to you waking up in an insane asylum. And I know you're, you're probably thinking, that's the upsetting bit, right? It's gonna end with the reveal that this has all been a hallucination, right? That it's like a fucking student film. Is it really gonna end like this? Well, no, it's not. Uh, there's still a good hour or so after this, if, if you could just be patient for a goddamn second. And listen to me, quit shutting me out. Just let me in. Let me in there. I'm knocking on the door. It's cold outside. I don't have a jacket. So for a brief period, it seems like you and many of the inhabitants of Arkham are suffering from some kind of shared delusion, imagining this post-apocalyptic life when in reality, they are all drooling in hospital beds. With the threat of an impending lobotomy, the only way out seems to be through the mind. So you take a cocktail of drugs to either put you back into a hallucinogenic coma or back to maybe reality, where you are still on a table about to have some spooky experiment done to you, but this time by a race of aliens. Whatever they were planning to do to you is interrupted by a different race of aliens waging war on these aliens, and in the chaos of their fighting, we slip out and wander around for something to do, meeting back up with this guy in Is from the Max, and he says, hey, remember how we had that deal so I could take you to this planet because you wanted to come here, I think? Uh, and in order to fulfill your end, you gotta pick one of your companions and stab them. So you pick one of them and stab them and that's the end. Um, okay, you can come back now. <laughs> Look, the important thing about this ending is that it's not an ending. It's it's not where the story ends, it's just where it stops. It is a random, not particularly noteworthy plot point where the developers decided to give up. I'm not being hyperbolic, it, it, it may as well be the ending to Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And Cultic Games somewhat owns up to this. About a week after its launch, they posted an update on Steam. We had to make a tough decision. Hurry the finale and exclude some of the best content we worked on, or complete the game on a cliffhanger, giving later parts of the saga the attention they truly deserve in future installments. It was the only way for Stygian Reign of the Old Ones to see the sunlight, and eventually become the complete story we envisioned. So we created Reign of the Old Ones as a beginning of a longer saga. Although Reign of the Old- you, you can shorten that up. Uh, although Reign of the Old Ones is a complete game in itself, it does not conclude Stygian's full narrative cycle as we expressed in the update we published right before the release. We'd love to see the story continued in the future and have already begun con concepting and designing on what will follow Reign of the Old Ones. We are more than ready to jump on board for the next part of the Stygian saga, if that is what the stars foretell. For now, we have a clear mission, fixing the issues that some of you have been encountering and adding some of the features you've been asking for to make Stygian Reign of the Old Ones a better game release. At the risk of being an asshole, I'd like to break down why this message is upsetting to me, and upsetting because I enjoyed so much of this game. Also, I can't even imagine the frustration some of the backers must feel, because it's clearly not the product they helped find. I think the biggest point of contention I have here is with the sentence, although Reign of the Old Ones is a complete game in itself, it does not conclude Stygian's full narrative cycle as we expressed in the update we published right before the release. This is not a complete game narratively or even from a gameplay standpoint. Ending the game on a cliffhanger is not something you can successfully do last minute. There are plenty of great installments in a series that end on a cliffhanger, but that's because they also complete an arc first. If that was the case, there wouldn't be not only an unfinished main quest, but a variety of side quests that have no resolution. They do not become relevant in both plot and programming. Like, they're still sitting there in my quest log, unfinished, and there was no way to finish them. 
them. How does this translate to, this is the end of a complete game? Also, the final moments provide nothing of consequence. It doesn't even seem to be relevant to the Dismal Man or finding the Necronomicon. It's just a thing that happens. The only significance of that moment is this is what they had. To spoil what I can only assume will be a reoccurring theme throughout this video, if the game continued on the path it was on up until the blasted street, I would have almost nothing, nothing critical to say about this. Well, oh no. I mean, the story wasn't that great. It was it was just amusing seeing all these references stitched together in a fun way. But it does, it seems antithetical to the source material to have endless open spookiness and violence. But yeah, I'm not hard to appease with Lovecraft shit. Like, even if it was a shitty, predictable ending, like having the protagonist wake up and it all have been a dream, it, it could have ended with the fourth wall breaking and we enter the cultic game studio and meet the dev team and they explain to you that you're a character in a computer game that they can't afford to finish, but they need to publish it as a complete game in order to recoup any money from the investment. The more I think about it, that's, that's probably an idea I would really enjoy, but I would have taken solace in the fact that it was a complete enough story that it, it got somewhere. Anywhere. You write for a cliffhanger. You don't stop mid sent Stygian's gameplay is most recognizably a nod to early CRPGs, but with an emphasis on punishment and survival over winning and character growth. Where those games featured mechanics that allow your character to grow and excel at certain skills by the end of the game, this one doesn't really last long enough for that to happen. And there are a lot of mechanics put in place to pair any gain with substantial loss. In theory, a lot of what Stygian proposes to do sounds wonderful and sounds like exactly something I would like. And and I did like it for a time, but much like the story, you realize it was designed to accommodate a larger, longer experience, but is now sawed in half like a red-headed cosmetology student. I mean, something that, uh, something else that gets, that, that gets cut in half. Let's start with the character creation. You pick if you want to be a man or a lady. I want to be a lady. You pick between three age ranges, which will determine your starting attributes and how many skill points you can distribute at the start. Then we have eight archetypes you choose from. These are our classes that, of course, excel in different things, and you can choose from four different backgrounds, which make your selection a little more specific. I chose to be a performer with the movie actor background because that's what I like to roleplay as a wealthy, white, entitled actress, especially in the 1920s because it was classier. You know, if something didn't please you, you could just say something shitty, you'd throw a feather boa over your shoulder, take a drag from a cigarette in one of those long, little skinny holder things, and you disappear into the fog. <laughs> uh, next, we choose a belief system. This is something that is quite clever and specific to this interpretation of a CRPG because a belief system is integral to role playing because the closer your character sticks to these principles, the more likely they are to gain sanity in certain situations, which you're going to want to do a lot of all the time, as much as you can. So choosing something like the materialistic belief system means you'd regain sanity by saying or doing things that are selfish or self-indulgent. I went with humanistic uh, because I don't, I don't know what it is about role-playing games, I'm given the option to be whomever I want, and I can't even pretend to be anything more than a goody two-shoes. And a lot of Stygian seems to function in familiar ways, taking clear notes from games like Fallout. You walk around hub areas, talk to characters with dialogue options that can be affected by your skill set. In games like this, I like to pour points into speechcraft because that usually leads to some interesting results, and I like pretending that I make words good, you can befriend certain characters and convince them to join your party. And since this game was released in a state, I I'm going to talk about the game as it is currently. I don't know exactly what they plan to implement later on, but as it is, companions are for the most part just help in combat. Uh, one time one of them helped me learn more about something using the research skill, but I didn't see any other way of implementing a companion skill or doing much else with them, like that never came up again. I never figured out how to activate that or will that to be helpful again. It was just, it was actually kind of uh, unnerving that all of a sudden she was helpful and then de never talked to me again. Also, one thing I would have liked to know in advance is that if your party is full and you meet a new companion and you want to swap one out, telling someone that you want to part ways is permanent. Like that character is gone now. 
which I feel like any other RPG would just have them return to wherever you found them to wait for you, but no, they just f***ing hit the bricks for good. They're probably dead in a ditch somewhere. In general, this game is pretty dreadful at explaining its mechanics. A big difference from Fallout and a prevalent challenge to Stygian is sanity and angst. I didn't go through the game using every class and configuration, so presumably sanity gain could be more forgiving for other players, but it wound up being one of the most difficult parts of the game, acting nearly as a second, more fragile health bar. A frequent theme that shows up in Lovecraft's writing is going mad from the revelation, a phrase coined in The Call of Cthulhu. The dude was afraid of a lot of things, including scientific and technological progress, so stories often incorporated some kind of forbidden or arcane knowledge that man was not meant to know, and to learn this knowledge is to release us from our placid ignorance and turn us into gibbering madmen. This is reflected in the sanity mechanic. You can lose sanity in a number of ways, from seeing something otherworldly, witnessing an act of violence, and when traveling on the world map, you'll sometimes be stopped and put through a text adventure scenario that will mostly, without fail, result in you losing sanity. Losing enough will give you schizophrenia, which I, I'm not certain, but from what I can tell, is a permanent affliction to your character that manifests in a number of ways. It might not be permanent, I just never figured out how to do it, but it's just like nothing is explained, so I, I, I don't know. I, I, I figure it's like real life schizophrenia, it's not something you just go to a witch doctor and they give you a tincture of something and then you don't have it anymore. I'm assuming you have that for the rest of the game. But schizophrenia will affect you in a variety of ways that are mildly bothersome outside of combat and infuriating in combat. But outside, you'll start to see bizarre NPCs with animal heads walking around saying random shit, and in nearly every conversation you hold, one or more of your options will be overruled by schizophrenia to make your character sound clearly unstable. You can finish the rest of the game like this, well enough, but if your sanity reaches zero, it will result in a game over. You can regain sanity by completing actions or making dialogue choices that appeal to your belief system. Or you could drink alcohol or do drugs. These do refill your sanity and can have other benefits as well. Uh, obviously, th this is there is some magic realism here because in, in real life, substance abuse it is often a result of mental illness, but uh, I think we can agree that it doesn't help. You know, but for the sake of game mechanics, uh, let's not dwell on that, especially because it's only really a helpful option for so long as you can become addicted to certain items. And if you go long enough without consuming these items, you'll start to receive a number of debuffs in your withdrawals. There are also ways you can and restore sanity while resting. If you have a book that appeals to your belief system, you can set your character to read it while resting, or set them to socialize with a companion. I feel like I'm making it sound like you have a lot of options to reverse your insanity, so, you know, everything's gonna be fine, but this will always be an issue, because they just throw out negative sanity points like Blizzard throws out non-apologies. There are so many moments where I would lose sanity either more or equal to the amount I had literally just gained. For example, you can get some sanity points by making sinful back alley love with a sex worker, and that gave me three sanity points. But immediately upon doing that, my companion Sonia was upset, and my, I don't know, guilt that I disappointed my friend made me lose two sanity. So I just paid 30 cigarettes for a good time, and now I'm getting a guilt trip for it. Pretty cool, huh? There was one moment where I completed a rather extensive quest, and the sanity payout was pretty generous, and I literally lost all of it on the fucking wall. Walk back home. I'm a successful Hollywood actress in the scummy 1920s. I'm sure not every single thing is gonna give me a panic attack. I'd like to at least be able to roleplay that for a goddamn second. The other thing is angst. Taking damage both physically and mentally increases your angst bar. That moves alongside your level experience. So as you're leveling up and raising your character stats and being rewarded with perks, you are also leveling up angst, which punishes you with permanent negative status effects that you choose. You also need to eat and rest regularly, lest you get more debuffs. So you already have a lot working against you, and it's it's just that that's not even half of it. Combat seems to be divisive from what I can determine from user reviews, and this is another thing that in theory works, and that in the beginning I found enjoyable. The core of some solid tactical turn-based combat is here, and it makes some attempt to modernize and include new ideas that don't work. I'm sorry, I'm, tr I'm trying to be nice. I we wouldn't want to overdo it now, would we? Like looking at it, it looks great. There is no denying that the presentation here is fantastic. I, I think it's kind of slow, and, and it can feel tedious and more often than not, I just found myself trying to escape. 
which uh, even the loading screen tips suggest you do. There is even a chance to do something called a progressive escape, where you end the encounter but still maintain the experience and items looted during it. I, I feel like that, that might be a good idea, but the fact that you can loot in combat creates its own issues. I think they may have addressed this in a recent update, but you can't stand on a space with a dead body, and if you try to, it will loot the corpse, which spends action points and wastes a turn. It's, it's all around not all that well thought out. But back to escaping, it's not often I was escaping to avoid a difficult fight that I knew I wouldn't be able to overcome. It's just not worth it most of the time. Consuming resources and sacrificing health and sanity, it's a frustrating process, especially when it just seems like they are piling on debuffs and negative effects. Enemies can use attacks that drain your sanity further in large amounts, which make critical failures or berserk modes more likely. You can use cover, but it's never explained and it's useless anyway. The game just really needs to explain itself because it's so unintuitive, and the absurd amount of bugs make the intuitive parts just as upsetting. There is a restart combat option, which I initially made a note of as being a nice thing to include, but it never seemed to just work as advertised. There was always a 50-50 chance something in the process would fuck up. For example, there's a fight that requires you to have a lamp equipped. It's the only fight that requires a lamp, and it doesn't tell you that you need to have it, but that's neither here nor there. But you need to have a lamp in your offhand, otherwise your characters will be all but useless in a fight, and the encounter will begin really unfair for you. You will lose much more sanity because you can't see anything and everybody's freaking out. But more than once, I would use the restart combat option and it would restart the combat with my lamp unequipped, which really puts me at a disadvantage right off the bat. Other times I would hit this button and with no apparent cause my sanity would be completely drained. It's just gone. When I entered the fight it was there, but now it's gone. See, I'm getting myself all worked up about it and, and, and losing direction. I, I don't even know if I said all that needs to be said about the combat, but I'm gonna move past the combat for a second. Uh, I want to talk about saving. The way this game saves, again as it is now, is baffling to me. Unlike any other game in this genre, you cannot manually save. The closest it comes to that is that you can save and exit, which is technically manual, uh, but not convenient in the slightest. You have like eight or so, I don't care, save slots, uh, and the game auto saves when you enter a new area. Not in the area you are now standing in, but at the entrance to it in the previous area. This means that anytime you load a save file, you will most likely need to walk right back into the next area, triggering another save in that same spot and erasing an earlier save. I don't know how to vocalize that exactly. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to say why this is so dumb. So here's a visualization. You are standing in A, you walk into B. This saves you in A, not B. So you die in B, and load the last save, which is A. So you need to walk back into B, which saves again in A. It's fucking unacceptable. Beginning to look a lot like fish men. How do you fuck that up so hard? Like of all the things that you could you could come across in the quality assurance of this game, I feel like that would be just glaring. There's just so much here and so many concepts that sound great to play around in, and they look the part, but none of them feel like they are 100% realized. Things just don't work like you want them to, and sometimes just don't work. There were several times I just had to restart because the UI stopped responding or just some aspect of it didn't do what it was supposed to do and it effectively broke the experience. There are whole methods of gameplay like the crafting system that feel useless because the game's abrupt ending. It's like they don't have enough time to become useful. What few moments you actually need to craft something for story purposes, an NPC can do it for you, and you don't come across parts often enough to make it a better option than just buying shit. I never felt like I was strapped for cigarettes, so why not just buy things I need? Uh, spells are handled pretty well. <laughs> That's one situation where I feel like I'm intentionally wagering my health and sanity for a positive outcome. There are things that work here, and there are good ideas, but there is so little done to disguise the fact that the other half of this book is concept art and blank pages. It feels designed to accommodate something the scale of Fallout or Boulder's Gate, but given the game's length, even if that was successful, it just doesn't fit. If I can be constructive, instead of venting, of course most of this could have been addressed with more time in the oven. But here we are. Number one, fix saving. I'm astounded that this was shipped without someone saying, hey, should people be allowed to save when they want? Two, combat could feel 
less like a slog, like it's, it's not even the cruel difficulty, it's the pacing. 3. Make companions more useful, both to gameplay and story. 4. Just get rid of crafting, it's not necessary, or at least don't have it be a skill. It's not like you get XP for accomplishing anything with it. I can't stress how much I enjoyed the first few hours of Stygian. There could be an exceptional game here, it's just not here yet. I still want it to be here. You think I ever learned my lesson about anything? No, you can fucking take your time. You can spit on me, I don't care. Dude, how do I keep fucking this up? Stygian's art style is probably its most unique and memorable quality. It is a distinct hand-drawn style reminiscent of the pulp and sci-fi magazines that were one to publish Lovecraft's work. Most of the time, I enjoy the look of the game. Some of the animations for things like spellcasting and cutscenes are actually animated frame by frame instead of the more animatic style seen in the rest of the gameplay. And it's those little touches that really make this look shine. On initial glance, I would have referred to this perspective as isometric, meaning a centered image where we can see the dimensions of objects and whatnot, but the developers referred to it as an axonometric perspective, um, and after a good 30 minutes reading the same two articles over and over again, I think I know what that means now. They are similar, but axonometric can be more off-centered and skewed uh, than the isometric view. I don't know, honestly, the concept is rapidly fading from my memory because it didn't have anything to do with ghouls or or ghoul t The UI is functionally suspect. <laughs> but it is gorgeously designed, and a joy to look at. I love all the character portraits and the design and look of them. They all look like fun characters to play as. Though the blasted street area did not agree with me, I thought the color out of space effect was really interesting and otherworldly, even though it seemed to still trigger and drain my sanity when I was in the menu, uh, which doesn't seem fair. That seems like a cheap shot. You're, like, you're already getting my sanity so many different ways. You don't gotta, you don't, you don't gotta be sneaky about it. The general style has drawbacks in that particularly bland areas look really bland, but those are few and far between. Most of the time there's a lot of life and detail in environments. Sound design is really crisp and unique. A lot of good sound going on here, and I especially like all the little sounds and chimes that activate when you trigger something in the UI, like getting a journal update or getting XP from something. It's downright euphoric. It feels like I'm doing something. It feels like I'm succeeding and I'm being a good boy. It feels like I'm getting rewarded, like you're giving me a little treat and you're just like stepping on it. What the fuck was that? I like the volume up really high. There isn't much in the way of voice work. No characters have voiceovers with the exception of like small incidental bits like a street merchant or some enemies. I didn't mind it, but I'm sure voiceovers could be done that might enhance it. I guess it wouldn't hurt. The soundtrack is great, but there isn't a whole lot of it. You're gonna hear the same collection of three or so songs and ambient tracks throughout the whole game, and they're good. The charm does last for a while. But uh, like my enjoyment for most things in Stygian, by the time we near the end, it all seems so distant. I, f I felt like I was on a roll of positivity there, but then I, I, I fucked it up. Let me uh, let me check my notes. Maybe I had something more complimentary to say. All right. Uh, nope. Uh, woo, nope. Oh. Uh, nope. I mostly found myself agreeing with negative and positive reviews for the game. They both pretty much echo the same sentiment. Which should go to show you how plainly obvious the game's flaws are, that people who rated it positively and negatively open with, they love the game, but did the developer ever fix the damn game? I really want to enjoy the game, but the damn bugs keeps me from enjoying the game. It frustrates me. This game is good, but the bug is fucking annoying, especially when in the middle of a fight. Dear developer, please, 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 Fix the damn game. Sincerely, player. <laughs> exactly! It's negative, but he wants to play the game! This is not a horror game, just a weak point-and-click toy 
with a ridiculously low effort turn-based combat system. I fell asleep like three times when I tried to play this. I get that you're a big strong man and you don't spook easily, but this is most certainly a horror story. Uh, the effect of horror is of course subjective, but yes, this is what they were going for. Um, it's not a point and click game, it's an RPG, you clearly don't know anything about games. That's okay, I forgive you for that. I don't think any part of this was low effort. I don't think I've implied that so far. Any failing this game has is not for lack of effort as far as I can tell. I mean, maybe they could have spent more money on the game instead of on books and leather bound covers and robes, but I think a lot of care went into the successful bits of this game. This is the end? I don't think the story is complete. I think this is uh, pretty much the best distillation of my reaction. A confused, critical sentence, but nevertheless, a thumbs up. Stygian Reign of the Old Ones is a game with justifiably mixed reactions. It's the gamble you make when you finance your game with Kickstarter. You have to raise a number that you can't be certain of, and then temper your ambitions down to meet that number. And this is clearly not the best case scenario. What we have here is a very impressive and lengthy demo for what could have been a stellar Lovecraft RPG. The story and world are a joy to explore, there are some moments of competent and challenging combat. It's absolutely charming to look at, it has great sound design and a fitting soundtrack, I still have that somber jazz number that plays in the pub stuck in my head, but with the exception of the consistently great artwork, just about all that is unrecognizable by the time the credits are rolling. I realize at this point, it's out of anyone's hands, like, the game is out the way it's going to be and save for a long future of patches or DLC, nothing is going to change that. Part of me does feel sympathetic to this team, I'm sure they wanted the game to mirror their original vision, but they made all the choices to get here, and some of those choices are things that aren't acceptable to me. This is one circumstance I would absolutely support releasing in early access. They would not have made as much money initially as they would with an official release, but it would have been honest, and it might have taken longer and been less initially rewarding, but it might have resulted in a game that I'd want to play again, and could have been one of my favorite games. So I can't, in good conscience, recommend this game as it is. And if I did, it would only be if you knew that what you are essentially doing is helping a fledgling indie studio either finish the game or recover from it. I think the best course of action from them is to double down and bring some good out of this mess. Don't set it aside as a complete game and work on something else. Commit to finishing it. But I also understand that's not the safest bet to make. I don't want to contribute to discouraging the development team or dismiss this project as a lost cause because I want the game this was supposed to be. Based on what I've seen so far, that could be a very good game. And maybe I'm overreacting here, maybe unrelated events are worsening the, the sting of disappointment. I don't actually have a resolution to that thought, I'm, I'm just saying maybe that's the case. Uh, yeah, sorry if that was kind of anticlimactic, but it uh, doesn't feel good, does it? Alright, we did it guys. <laughs> Special thanks to Ailing Uncle. Heck! Resurrection. This deal is getting worse all the time. Dark Raptor 86, Nazim Kamal Ure, News Time, Charles Marr, Karen Mavel, Game Master, Oisto, Mr. Benjamin, Mr. Roboto, Baird Brown, Alexander Sundin, and Octo for donating at the highest tier on my Patreon. <laughs> you guys are you guys are the reason. You're the you're you're everything, man. You're keeping this keeping this train moving. You're keeping this uh, rusty minecart moving down that track. I don't know what that means, but I, I thank you.